All right. So are we good to go? Or All right. Great. Thanks. Well, it's great to be back with you. Um, thanks for coming back and being ready for another session. Um, you could have just slipped out the door after the first one, so I take it as some sort of vote of confidence that mostly we came back. So this session, um, hopefully we're going to get a little bit more sort of nitty-gritty, practical, hands-on, how do we do some of these things. Um, all really simple things. This isn't like rocket science. This isn't complicated. Um, basic obedience to basic ideas of our, of our Orthodox Christian faith. You know, what we said last hour wasn't really complicated either. Again, it's just basically doing what it is to be Christian. So we're going to start out with a, a basic question. If Christ commissioned us to make disciples of all nations, you know, if that was the job, the last big command that he gave us, the thing that he told every one of us to do when we were baptized, how are we doing on that? How does it look? Are we doing a good job? Job all finished? We can all, you know, say, thank God we did that, or do we have a lot left to go? So if we look at our world today, um, approximately one-third of the world is Christian. Two-thirds of the world aren't Christian. So you can look at that as sort of a glass half full, half-empty half sort of way. Um, you know, the, the largest religion in the world is Christianity. So we could yay us. We're a uh, you know, bigger team than anybody else. Um, but Christ didn't send us to make disciples of 30% of the world. He said make disciples of all nations. But if we, if we break our numbers down there a little bit more, there's also some other interesting things we might want to notice. One of those that is that only 4% of the world are Orthodox Christians. And this is counting both Oriental and Eastern Orthodox families. And it's counting basically everybody that self-identifies. So if you're in a country that's primarily Orthodox and everybody says they're Orthodox, but they, even if they only go to church, only 2% of them go to church, they're still all going to be counted in that number. So about 4% of the world self-identify as Orthodox, which an interesting thing is, is that's half of what it was 100 years ago. So about 8% of the world would have self-identified 100 years ago. The absolute number is larger because of the growth of world population, but the percentage of the world has, is half of what it was. So if 4% is Orthodox, what does that mean for what percent is not orthodox um, 96. 96 percent of the world aren't orthodox. Um, now, we, we thank God for our Christian brothers and sisters in other traditions, but we do believe, as orthodox Christians, that there is a fullness in orthodoxy, a fullness of what Christ came to bring. So we could look at this in several ways. Um, there was one general during the Civil War, one of his aides came and told him, general, we're surrounded. He said, great, we can attack in any direction. So 96% of the world out there to be, to be one to orthodoxy. Um, but we also want to think a little bit about the, the other sections, particularly that very large section, around 27% of the world on the, in red on the bottom part of the graph. And there's a lot of literature on this, and it's written about and broken down in a lot of different ways. Um, and you might get slightly lower or higher numbers in different ways. But Basically, these are people that have never chosen to be Christian or not. So we say, well, maybe two-thirds of the world is not Christian because they chose not to be and they have free will. This part of the world has never made any decision about Christ. Just like most of you have never made any decision whether to fly to Mars or not, right? There's no option for you. You haven't decided about it. It's no option for them, and we'll talk about why that is. But basically, there is no witness of the Christian faith in their geographical region, their language, or their cultural ethnic group. So they've never decided. The other 40% are basically a lot of the people that you know around here that are not Christian. And in a sense, we call them evangelized non-Christians. But a question, and this is part of what father was intimating earlier in, in the question, they have access to the gospel. They could walk into your church. They could hear it in their language, in their geographical location. But how many of those people have actually, truly, of the, the non-Christians that you know, have truly understood Orthodox Christianity and said, no, 
Some of them have, but I think lots of them haven't. You know better, and this will differ for each circle, but for many people, they may be with, live within easy access of the gospel, but simply never have come across a person where they could really understand it, really connect with it. So in a certain sense, they are unevangelized as well. So if we look at the world today, 96% of the world isn't Orthodox Christian yet. Around a quarter to a third of the world have never heard the gospel at all. That's somewhere between one and a half and two billion people that have never heard the gospel at all. Um, and then lots of other people who live in proximity to the gospel, but perhaps have, have never understood it in a way to be able to respond to it. So one of the texts that we looked at earlier was this from Acts, um, and we actually read this um, recently, um, where Christ says that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is an important text because it helps us formulate our strategy for missions. So there are four places mentioned there, and if we think of Christ speaking this in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the local city where he spoke these words. And so we need to understand them accordingly. So your Jerusalem is here in the LA area, or maybe you wanna bracket it down to a smaller part of the LA area since that's so big. Um, so you are called to be witnesses locally right here. Christ said, you will be my witnesses. We are called to be his witnesses here. And we'll talk about this as, as we go along, but in terms of balance and proportion, we talk about the missionaries that stay and the missionaries that go. You are all his witnesses, his missionaries, in this local area. And that is a task that you have. Then Judea was the, the wider region, the area around that, Southern California, how would you define your region? So we need to, our local area, our wider region. Samaria is that neighboring group that we don't like so well. Who is that for you all? Okay. So, Mexico. Mexico is, okay, so the neighbors, you know, the Samaritans were the people that didn't like so well, but even to the Samaritans, and then to the, the ends of the earth, the entire world. So these are four levels on which we need to think about missions, and it's important that we don't think that this is a consecutive process. Sometimes people tell me, well, you know, there's so much to do here, we're going to work in Jerusalem. Now, if that had been the church's strategy in the first century, where would we be at? How is the work done in Jerusalem? All perfect, perfect Orthodox Christian place? No, far, far from it, right? The work has never been done in Jerusalem. If they'd waited to finish Jerusalem, well, the Romans came in AD 70 and destroyed it, and that would have been the end of the church. But very early on, and God even actually sent a persecution in the book of Acts to maybe spread them out from Jerusalem a little bit, to be going on to other areas. So while they were still working in Jerusalem, they were also working in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So it's a both and command that the work is ongoing and will continue to be ongoing until Christ comes in every local area. But then because we are one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the Catholicity makes us think in terms of the whole, and it makes us think in terms of proclamation. So we must be Catholic and apostolic, being his witnesses and making sure that the church is witnessing for him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we're primarily going to focus in a lot of the rest that we say on the, on the ends of the earth part because that's the area that I have the privilege of working and being sent by you as a long-term missionary. But I want to say a little bit about being a witness in Jerusalem. How are you witnesses in Jerusalem? You're the experts on this for your own Jerusalem, but just a couple thoughts about it. And I think probably this community is doing a lot better on these things than some communities, but things always to think about. 
we build a strong, loving, welcoming community? I mean, is this a place where if you were speaking to somebody about faith, you would feel really good about saying, hey, come to church with me on Sunday. Come and see. Um, you know, I know a lot of people who attend liturgies in places that they, the last thing they would want somebody to do is come and see their church. Um, you know, is this a place where if you brought somebody in, they would feel like, wow, I have friends there now. I, I want to go back. Wow, those people are loving. Wow, you know, that's a place I want to be. Do you have a community like this? And we were talking about an excarnate world. One of the things the excarnate world is play, looking for is, is true relationship because they don't have it in their sort of virtual reality. Is this a place where people feel connected into true relationships when they walk through the door? Are we cultivating authentic Christian life? And I believe that you are, but just a reminder on this, you know, we can, we can get focused on how we're going to evangelize and forget that we can't give away anything we don't already have. If we aren't, each one of us, cultivating deep Christian life, then we don't have anything to give away. So we need to make sure that we, each and every one of us, in the context of our whole community, are really cultivating a deep Orthodox Christian life. Do we remember, do we remind ourselves, do we teach our community that each one of us were commissioned at our baptism to make disciples? That this isn't an optional extra, that you can come to church and you can have you know, the whole sort of Orthodox church deal, and, but that that includes also making disciples. Sometimes I think we have the idea, well, you can get the church deal, and then if when you want to buy the extension on the package, you could also talk to the people outside or do it. But it's, there's no extension. It's all part of the deal. And if we're faithful in our Orthodox Christian lives, that extension. You know, just imagine how ministry in the church would change if each family in the church every two years brought one other family. You'd have a building problem. You'd have a big problem with, you know, building space. You'd have, you'd have to build more churches. You know, just one other family every two years. The church would grow so fast you wouldn't know what to do. Um, are we working in that direction? <clears throat> so, are we sure that each and every person in the church is equipped you know, how many of us, if one of our friends came up to us and said, you know, I hear you're Orthodox, explain Orthodoxy to me. How many of us are equipped to say, yeah, let's sit down and talk about it. How many of us would have to say, well, we'll see when Father can meet you. Um, how many of us are really equipped to give an answer? Do we feel it's part of the life of our local community to equip each and every one of us to give an answer for the hope that's within us? So those are a few thoughts about Jerusalem. You know, you have lots of other thoughts, and I, I, I bet you're working really well in this area, but just a, a few thoughts. Now I want to talk about some of those other areas and the barriers. Why? Especially that, that red area on the graph we saw before. Now, walls have been big in our political life in the last year, and we're not talking about that. We're talking about barriers to people coming to understand the gospel. And there's three real barriers that we can talk about. So geography, language, and ethnic cultural identity. And these are three barriers that stand between people in the world, one and a half to two billion people, that make it impossible for them ever to hear the gospel. So if we think about geography, this is a map that is very, very rough, but it shows Darker colors are places with higher levels of self-identifying Christians. Um, lighter colors have less. So you see there's a big part of the world that's really light there. Um, it means there's a big part of the world where there aren't very many local Eucharistic communities witnessing the gospel. For people in those areas, if they are going to hear the gospel, they are going to have to either move somewhere else or somebody is going to have to come to them. There's going to have to be a crossing of geography. Now the map's a little bit deceptive because it shows whole countries in colors, when in reality 
within those countries there are also very variegated colors. There would be places of high Christian population, places of very low Christian population within each country as well. But there will be no witness in a place where there are no Christians. There is no local church of Jerusalem to witness to the neighbor. And so if we can't, we can't wait and expect those people to come and find us because they don't even have any understanding of faith to know that they need to come and find us. So we need to cross those boundaries of geography. We need to project witness into places where there isn't. Um, both into the, the macro areas where you can see big parts of the world, but in other micro areas around the world where there isn't currently significant Christian witness. Somebody, just simply because of geography, does not have the possibility of connecting with a Christian community. Okay, next, you think about language. There are thousands of languages in the world, and you could have a church next door to you, but if you don't speak their language, there might not be a geographical boundary, but if there's a language barrier, it wouldn't do you much good. Um, you're not going to walk through the door and find the gospel there if you don't speak that language. The language is a very, it's a very challenging barrier. It's a, it's a thing that takes years for us to cross. Let's see, we're gonna go back. So for most people, it takes approximately two years to gain just elementary proficiency in a second language. Sometimes with languages as close as English and Spanish, and people grow up in an area like this where you have many Spanish speakers in the environment, you might be able to do it in less than two years. Um, but we see with, with people coming to other countries, often it takes significantly more than two years to master a language. And when we're over 40, it's even longer and harder, more difficult. So language is a serious barrier. You know, you can cross the barrier of geography quite easily. Get on an airplane and you can be almost anywhere in the world in 24 hours. That's going to take you two years to cross the barrier of language. You say, well, what about translation? Well, you can translate, but that's not incarnate. You can't really incarnate in somebody's culture. And to translate the gospel is not simply taking the words and putting them into other words. It's much more complicated and much deeper than that. Translation is something of, of real experience. And so we need people that are willing to commit themselves to that process of crossing geography if necessary, crossing language. We can't expect that everybody in the world is just going to learn English because that's easy for us. Um, you know, what about us learning their language sometime? And, and the doxology can never happen until their language is, is truly learned and the gospel is truly incarnate. The third one is the cultural ethnic identity. This one is is a harder thing to get a handle on what exactly it is, and so I don't actually even have a picture for you, but it's something that's very, very real. It is very hard for us to associate deeply with people of another cultural ethnic group. Um, it is hard for the, the, the people that we saw pictures of and where my parents worked. They would never walk into the church of a Spanish cultural ethnic Spanish church. It wasn't them. They wouldn't be accepted there and they wouldn't feel comfortable there. You know, and you can think of this in, in many other ways. There are many cultural ethnic enclaves that you simply would not feel comfortable going into and you wouldn't be accepted there. Um, and language takes two years to learn. Cultural ethnic incarnation is even harder and takes longer. Um, you know, it takes many, many years in truly being immersed with people in a culture to really come to be incarnate and to understand their culture and think like them and be able to actually articulate the gospel 
in their culture is very, very difficult. So these are some of the challenges we face in trying to project witness around the world so that that 27% of the world will not be without a witness. So they will actually have the, the choice, the chance to choose. And part of the good news is that we, we do have some tools in this. We have, as a church in North America, the Orthodox Christian Mission Center, which has been established and is, is um, you know, the official structure of our church in North America to do the work of making disciples of all nations. And this is, we've had tremendous progress in this you know, over the past 25 years. 25 years ago, we really didn't have a structure for doing this work around the world. Um, the OCMC grew originally through as a, a branch of a department of the Greek Orthodox Church, then was made a pan-Orthodox structure, um, and is now the structure for all of us as Orthodox Christians in North America for doing this work of making disciples of all nations. And the Mission Center has a lot of different programs, and for the sake of time, we're not going to try to go through all of these. You're blessed to have a board member here that can present all of those if, if um, you would like to, to go through them. And they all have a particular role and thing that they're designed to do. But the thing that I want to, to say with you is that out of all of those programs, there is one tool in the toolbox that can really accomplish the work of incarnational mission. And that's the long-term missionary. It's only by going and actually living with people for many years that we can actually learn their language, learn their culture, become incarnate for their salvation. We have many other tools that can help us in that process of projecting incarnational missionaries into places, but we have to be sure that, that we remember that's the one tool in the toolbox for actually accomplishing that work, for actually placing witness for those around the world that aren't in a position to make a choice right now. Now, one of the challenges as our church grows in mission and grows in its missionary understanding is to make sure that we don't get sidetracked. Now, you know, churches realize their call to make disciples of all nations, and they want to do mission activity, and it's their desire, you know, to project, deploy, you know, long-term incarnational missionaries. So that's, that's the goal. And so we start often doing some stuff. We have some mission capacity building programs. We send some people on short-term teams and things like that. And those are great things that can build that capacity. But what sometimes happens is those people come back, report to the parish, tell about the great things they did. Everybody gets excited. They say, that was so great. Let's do it again. And so we do it again, and then we report on it again. And we have a mission speaker, and we feel enthusiastic about that. And you see how that can actually become a closed loop there of doing mission capacity building things and reporting about those things and feeling excited about them. But there's a danger that we don't actually do much in really projecting those long-term incarnational missionaries. And the reality is, at this point, we only have about 20 long-term incarnational missionaries from the entire Orthodox Church in North America. And essentially that number has been stable for the last 15 years. Um, so we're, we're doing more and more mission stuff, but we have the danger of just becoming more and more missionish and not having a focus on what we actually need to do to project those long-term incarnational missionaries in the places that we need to, to actually have Christian witness, to build those new nuclei of faith that the Archbishop was talking about in the quote that, that we learned. So one of the things that lots of people say when I talk about things like this, they say, well, you know, all that's great, 
but we have so many needs here. There's so much to be done here. And that's true. There's a lot to be done here. And that's why we're going to talk about balance and proportion. Now, we see this dear man, and you all sort of snicker when it comes up, because why? It's out of balance and proportion. Now, if there was either half of his body was like the other, it'd be okay. That's him. But when one side is all built up and big, and the other side is all tiny, you say, that's not healthy. That's not balance. It's not proportion. It's obviously not healthy. And so this is what we need to think about in our Orthodox Christian lives and in our stewardship and our administration of the resources that we have. Is it balanced and proportional how we use the resources we have? So we are one of the, well, we're the richest country in the world. We're the richest society in world history. Um, you know, this, this area is probably one of the most affluent societies, you know, areas of the country. Um, how much of our resources should we be investing in us? And how much of our resources should we be investing in making disciples in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth? Um, you know, what's, what's the right balance and proportion there? Um, you know, given the fact that we are so immensely blessed in so many ways, you know, not just financially, we have passports that allow us to travel to most places in the world very easily. We have educational levels that most places in the world can only dream about. I mean, you have... It's just normal that we have, heading almost every one of our congregations, we have priests and many times several priests that have master's level training. Most of the world can't even dream about that. Um, so, so many ways. So, if we were to think about, this is just a graph that is random. Nothing stands for anything. But if you were to think about it and say, okay, in the grand picture of things, what part of our resources would it be good for us to spend on us? And what part of our resources would it be good for us to spend on projecting Christian witness around the world, making disciples of all nations? Um, you know, I mean, we have a lot of stuff to do. We have to feed our kids and pay our mortgages and do all these different things. Then we have to build our churches and pay our clergy. And all of those things are important things that need some of our resources. But what part of the resources, what, which one of those pie pieces would we say, if, if our Orthodox Christian faith really is the greatest treasure in the world, and we've been given this level of responsibility, which of those pie pieces would you choose as the one that, that's about right, that would be balanced and proportional. Well, I want to tell you that the little red sliver there at the top is so much too big, it's, it's way, way, way bigger than what we actually do. Um, if we put what we actually do on there, it would be invisible. So we put the smallest sliver we could. Um, so to say this in another way, we as Orthodox Christians in North America spend more on toilet paper than we do on making disciples of all nations. Now, toilet paper is important. Nobody's going to say it's not important, right? We've got to have a balance and proportion in how we invest in important things. But is that the level at which we should be investing for making disciples of all nations? Now, I think in this community, you're probably at a different level than a lot of our other communities. But in general, if we look at orthodoxy across North America, that's where we're at. Um, so something to think about, something you know, to meditate on. So next time you use toilet paper, just think about that. You know, it's a moment of silence. Um, you can think about that. But, you know, maybe it's just not worth it. Maybe it's not worth the bother. So I want to share, you, share with you another little story about my childhood 
It just gives a way of thinking, is it worth the bother? So I told you that um, you know, eventually we were invited to go to the mountains if we would be incarnate like them. And on our first journey as a family up into the mountains, it was a 30 mile journey across these sorts of trails to get up to the place where we were going to live in the mountains. The first time we went up, it took three days. It wasn't supposed to take that long, but there were a series of unexpected events along the way that strung out the journey. So there was rain and stuff on the first day that delayed us. On the second day, we had stayed the night at some houses on one of the hillsides. And as we were starting out that second morning, um, the mules were all saddled up with packs like this, um, like I'm sitting on top of there, and starting to go down the trail, you know, up, or up the trail as the case was. Um, and one of, the, one of the boys that was one of the mule drivers um, had developed a little extra interest in one of the young ladies back at the houses we were leaving. And so he was back at the house and not with the mules that he was supposed to be watching. And so one of his mules was going around one of the corners. There was a rock sticking out and he banged his pack against the rock and reared up and fell off the hill and rolled down into the valley, 600 feet down into the valley over a cliff and landed in a tree. And so my dad and one of the other mule drivers had to go down and find this mule and find out what happened to it. So while dad is going to find the mule that fell off the hill, my mom is sitting there beside the trail with my brother who was four, myself who was two, and uh, my baby sister. And she's sitting there and beginning to wonder, what am I doing here? Who thought that this was a good idea for me to be beside the trail in this Indian reservation in Colombia by myself with three small children? And as she's meditating on these fine things, another mule driver came up the trail and saw a white woman there, probably the first white woman you know, in world history to be sitting along the trail in that spot, and was quite surprised. And he said, what are you doing here? And mom thought, that is a good question that I was just contemplating. But what she said is, I'm waiting for my husband, who's gone to find the mule that fell over the hill. Um, and he said, you know, it's not a good place for you to be. It's dangerous here. You shouldn't be here. And mom was thinking to herself, I was thinking just that thought myself. Um, but she didn't really say that to him. And they exchanged a few more pleasantries. And he went off up the hill. But as he was sort of disappearing around the corner, mom was thinking about it. Said, but why is he here? What's he doing here? She thought about, well, he's got two mules, and they're loaded with trade goods, and he's going to go up into the mountains. He's going to sell those, and he's going to come down, and he'll earn $30. So he's here for $30. And she thought, and I'm here because the king of the universe sent us to make disciples of these people who will never hear if we don't come, who will never know about God who loves them, who will be without God and lost in the world. I'm sent as a personal ambassador of the King of Kings to be here. Now he's here for $30 and I'm here on a personal embassy from the King of Kings. Which one of us is crazy? Which one of us doesn't make any sense? And um, you know, at that point she was really given the verse that you know, I've given you, I have not given you the spirit of fear but of power self-discipline and a strong mind. And they went on up the hill and lots of other adventures. But you know that's the question. And we sit in our very comfortable places. But what's crazy? What's worth it? Is it really? You know, is, our, is our sharing of the gospel with the rest of the world really toilet paper money? Or is there more that we could do? And our Lord told us, said, the harvest is plentiful. You know, sometimes it seems very difficult, but the Lord told us the harvest is plentiful. He said, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers into a harvest field. So are we, are we praying earnestly? 
You know, the interesting thing is that when we pray earnestly about things and we're, we're actually serious about it, God usually actually also engages us in doing something about it. What are we, what are we willing to do? What are we willing to do to move it from being sort of an abstract idea out there? And again, we don't need huge rocket science to move this forward. There are three basic things that we can do about this. Praying, giving, and going. And if we would do these things in a significantly different way, we could move and, you know, perhaps we're not going to evangelize 1.5 billion people in the next five years. Perhaps we're not, but we could be doing a lot more than we're doing. We could have a lot more balance and proportion. So I want to talk about these things real briefly, starting with the hardest one, and it'll get easier from here. Going. How many of you are ready to go? How many of you are ready to sign up, say, you know what, I'll commit my life or a substantial portion of it to go and to follow Christ's example, to be incarnate, to empty myself of my current life, my current likes, the things that I do, that I like, to empty myself of those and to fill them with someone else's life and language and culture for their salvation. As Christ did for us, you know, what we can give up is suburban America. He gave up heaven. So the prophet Isaiah had this experience, and the prophet heard the Lord say, who shall I go and who, will, who shall I send and who will go for us? And the prophet replied, here am I, send me. He was willing to go, and it was a fairly dangerous assignment. Read the book of Isaiah if you want to get a sense of what a challenging time that was. So, might God be calling somebody here? Um, might God be calling one of you? If you can uh, say with absolute certainty, you know what? No, I know for sure God's calling me to do what I'm doing here and now, and I understand that. Who might, be calling, who might he be calling around you? Who might he be calling in this community, in other church communities in this area? I, I have a very hard time believing that God is only calling 20 long-term missionaries from all of the Orthodox Church of North America. And we have many differences and way, different ways of looking at things from our, our evangelical brothers, but there are many churches not a lot bigger than yours that they have 20 long-term missionaries from that one parish. Um, there are many churches, no bigger than some of our larger Orthodox churches, that have larger missionary budgets than the entire Orthodox Church in North America. So, what about sending? So if, you, if you're not able to go, what is your church doing? What are your congregations, your people doing in terms of of partnership in sending. A model for this is the Apostle Paul who was sent by the congregations that he ministered to. And the, the letter to the Philippians is a letter that, that he wrote. It's a donor newsletter. He wrote to tell them how he was doing to encourage them. And he thanks them, and he thanks them for their partnership in the gospel. And this is what churches have the possibility of doing, of being partnerships, partners in the gospel, in the work going on around the world. Um, you share in God's grace with me. We have the, the blessing of being sent by you, but then those who send us, and we want to thank you, especially the, the local parish here, for your role in sending us and for the new role that you've taken on. We're very, very grateful for that. Thank you for being partners with us in the gospel. So some of the ways that local parishes can join in sending long-term missionaries, and this is our prayer card and our picture, but you know, if you don't like us, you can go on the website and you can find other missionaries to partner with. So you can't say, well, those hoppy people, they're just kind of annoying people and we're not going to, you can't get off the hook that way. We may be annoying and all, but there are other people as well that can be sent. But just for the sake of argument today, we put us up there. So for us to go, we need a support team 
to send us, to make it possible for us to, to be there. And there are several ways that you can support a missionary going. We have the, the prayer cards outside that we have already mentioned that you can pick up. Signing up for the newsletter is a real important part. I'm going to talk about this connection between the prayer and news in just a second. Um, financial partnership is very important, and we'll say just a little bit more about this. But then recruiting others. You know, we're a great group here this morning, but there's a much, much greater, larger group throughout this metropolitan area. All of you have a network with many other people that you could reach out to and recruit in this aspect of our Orthodox life. So I want to talk about prayer for, for a second here. Prayer is so important. You know, God, for his reasons, has chosen to work through us. Isn't that just wild? I mean, do you ever think about how crazy that is? You know, he could have instantly made the gospel known to every person on planet Earth, but instead he commissioned us to be his missionaries, to send us out. He works with us. And one of the very important ways that he works with us and through us is when we pray. He could do it all by himself. But so that we can partner with him, he says, I'll work when you pray. And so we are sent by you. We're sent to do the work. And I can go into, and we'll talk more about this next hour, I can go into my classroom in Albania, I can teach a pretty decent lecture on one of the early church fathers. We're pretty good at organizing events for children. We do a decent job of that. But you know, I don't have the power, even a little bit, to change the heart of one of my students. We don't have the power, even a little bit, to transform the lives of one of those children. But the Holy Spirit does, and his power is released when you pray. So you, here at home, in your prayer corner, or wherever you pray, or together in liturgy, by praying with us, you can be frontline warriors in that work of making disciples in Albania or other places around the world. And you know, the, the exciting thing is, is with the modern tools of communication, we can actually communicate about these things too. So God bless the missionary is a wonderful prayer. But if you, if you sign up for a newsletter and you actually know what's happening, and you pray very specifically about what's happening, and then you get another newsletter in a few months and see what God did through your prayers, that's exciting, that's fun. That's rewarding in, in being partners in the gospel. And so we, we would ask you to, to really take this on in a new way and to share this with others and, and pray for us and pray for our other missionaries. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about money and how much it costs to send missionaries. Often as Orthodox, we kind of have an idea that we do this in the Orthodox way and that the Emperor Justinian or one of the Russian czars or somebody, you know, Nicholas is footing the bill for missions. But the surprising thing is that those guys are dead. They've been dead for a long time. And that imperial model is no longer applicable to our life. So we're back to the apostolic model. St. Paul was sent out by local communities that supported his missionary work. And that's what we seek to do is to foster a team that sends us local Eucharistic communities across the country. Now for us as, as long-term missionaries, you know, it takes about as much to send a family overseas as it does to support a clergy family here in the U.S. I personally am not clergy, and many of our missionaries are not, but, you know, so for, for local churches, if they're considering on what level do we need to support missionaries, one of the things I suggest to them is that you can look at your clergy support. What does it cost your parish and your context to support one of your clergy? Could you give 10% of that to support a missionary? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a moment. And it's also important to understand that we as long-term missionaries sent through the Mission Center are each responsible for raising the financial support necessary to meet our budgets. 
So um, often people somehow think that the archdiocese pays all the cost of missions. If, you know, if, the, if, the, if the emperors and the czars aren't doing it, surely the archdiocese is doing it. Well, they're not. And, and they've set it up in a way that it's much more organic and personal between the missionaries that are going and the local Eucharistic communities that send. And so what we need is, is individuals and parishes to make commitments in order to make it possible for us to meet our budgets. Often in orthodoxy, we kind of have the idea of doing kind of fundraisers. We do a fundraiser for this and a fundraiser for that. This doesn't really work when you're long-term missionaries living overseas. We can't constantly be doing fundraisers in North America to support our work there because we're there and we're working full-time there. So what we need is, is people that will recognize the importance of this. And we have these envelopes outside and we also have the website, which we'll show you in just a second and decide to partner on an ongoing basis, and whether it's monthly or quarterly or whatever, you know, whatever works best. Um, and the church here is doing this, and we thank you for that, and I, I want to emphasize that. Um, but there are many churches that aren't. The vast, vast majority of Orthodox churches are not supporting any long-term missionaries. Zero. Um, so, but to partner on an ongoing basis to send a missionary to meet their financial costs, then it's important for churches to do this in a way that really partners with individual missionaries. If you send undesignated gifts to the mission center, that's wonderful and it helps to keep the overall structure running. And that's important and part of our giving needs to do that. But in addition, the long-term missionaries need your designated support. And each one of us as a, as a missionary sent by you needs enough designated support to meet our budgets. And I think it's really important for, for local churches to partner in a significant way with missionaries. And each church knows what, what their ability is to partner. But as missionaries, if we have a smaller number of churches partnering in a significant way, that allows us to build deeper relationships with our sending churches but then also to have fewer churches sending us so that we can focus more on the work that we're actually sent to do. Um, and another way to say this is if, if each of our churches that sends us supports us at a level of $100 a month, we would be able to visit each of those churches on, the, on our normal duty cycle of working two years in Albania and coming back for about eight to 10 weeks we would be able to visit each one of those churches on a Sunday, which is the only time you really can effectively visit an Orthodox church, every 20 years. Um, so it's not an effective business model. We need deep partnerships with around 10 churches that we can come and visit when we come back to the States, build a deep relationship, and then be able to focus on our ministry in Albania. So the, the OCMC is very modern. We have a website where you can do um, partnering and giving as well. Um, so OCMC.org, that's easy to remember. So again, remember to designate and um, make that an ongoing partnership. So one other way to think about this, um, and this is a particularly apt analogy for some of our, our larger churches that at this point don't support any long-term missionaries on any level. Um, so how many drink coffee occasionally? How many ever go to Starbucks? Okay, now would it be too big of an ascetic challenge for us as Orthodox communities if we chose to support a long-term missionary family at the rate of one coffee per month per family? Is that too high of a bar? too much to ask. So, you know, there we have the Starbucks menu. I don't know what you drink. You know, drinks are, you know, sort of two to five dollars. If you have a, a parish with a hundred families, five hundred dollars a month for one coffee a month per family. Um, bigger parishes could do even more. Just a way to think about it. Um, so, we talk about the cross a lot in the Orthodox Church. We have several Sundays a year for the cross. We're called to take up our cross and follow Christ, but Christ tells us to 
to count the cost before we do that. So don't, don't take this up and go forward if you're not really willing to count the cost. And he uses the analogy of the tower. You know, somebody doesn't start building a tower unless they're really willing to invest to finish it. If the things that we've been saying about our proclamation of the gospel, making disciples of all nations, are really part of our essential identity as Orthodox Christians, we need to count the cost and say, are we really willing to, to invest on that level of a coffee a month per family? Um, you know, count the cost at that level to be authentic in our Orthodox Christianity? Or should we give it up as a bad business and say, you know what, that's too expensive, that's too much, too much to do to, to do that. Uh, you know, we're sent by you and we're grateful for, for you that send us, but just imagine if we had a much broader level of willingness to partnership, much broader level of, of support for missionaries, a much broader level of young people willing to say, yes, I'll be sent, I'll go, I'll be incarnate for others. We could raise up not tens, but many, many missionaries to go around the world and share this incredible treasure of orthodoxy that we have. So we, we thank you for your support. We're very, very grateful for this community and choosing to support us in a significant way. Um, and that really makes a difference to us as we go back. Right now, um, we're preparing to, to go back to Albania in August. And the, the Mission Center has asked us, as we wrap up this time in the States, I've spoken to many communities and lots of communities have been interested in our work. So we want a partnership, we want to partner with you. Um, but it's harder to get from the, 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 the desire to the actual activity. So they've, they've asked us to work towards an additional $2,000 per month in designated giving towards our work in the next couple months before we go back. So that people that for the next two years would be willing to give. And that can be divided up, you know, four churches at $500 a month, you know, churches and individuals, different ways. Um, but that's what they feel would be really ideal for us to have a solid financial base for being able to focus on the ministry over the next two years. So that's the end of the second session. I'm happy to do questions now for a little bit. We have lunch, I guess. Is lunch ready or do we? Yeah, lunch will, will be served uh, when we're done here. Um, so maybe one question. Who's going to be the lucky questioner? So we've talked a lot about the financial commitments and obligations behind building an Orthodox mission out of North America. Uh -huh. um, what can um, our local churches do to build the personnel capacity behind sending full-time incarnate missionaries um, from North America? Well, one of the basic things is to start making this part of the life of our church. Um, you know, and probably you have more of this here than many places. Most Orthodox young people have never actually met a missionary, and they have never actually considered that that could be part of their lives. Um, we're going to meet with the young people tomorrow here, I think, and we're, we're excited about that because those are, those are the people that could be missionaries some way, someday. So I think in our, in our discipleship, starting when kids are very young all the way through our adult discipleship, you know, how many of our churches, when they, they catechize adults that are going to be baptized? So you know, part, of, part of this deal, part of if you're going to commit, get baptized, be part of this, part of it is making disciples of all nations. It's not part of our Christian, Orthodox Christian formation for the most part. And so I think that that is a big part of it. Another part of it is, is just the teaching on stewardship. We kind of have an idea that my life is my life and then I can cut off whatever little piece I want and give it to God. We don't have that idea that we were talking about at the beginning that Christ was incarnate for us and Christ as God became part of, of our created world and therefore our whole life is sacramental. And every breath we take, and every bite we eat, and every word we say is part of the sacramental life of life in God. 
Um, and therefore, it's not, well, I'm going to live my comfortable life and go to church sometimes, but it's all life in God. And then if we thought that way, we'd more likely say, well, maybe part of that life in God is sharing this life in God with that big part of the world that doesn't know. So I think it's, it's an overall project that needs to be a long-term project, but of Christian formation to really understand and see the world as Christ sees the world.